Have you ever experienced an unexplainable connection? Very intense yet familiar at the same time? Almost as if you've known this person your whole life. You may have even noticed you share similar interests, thoughts, strengths, and weaknesses. You reflect them as equals. A sense of extreme knowing, trusting, and synchronicities. You find this strong tug of heartstrings and emotions hard to explain. But strangely, with this person, it just feels at home. If any of this resonates, then this is the episode for you. Welcome, Soul Tribe, to episode two, Twin Flames. It's a pleasure to have our very first guest to the podcast, Dr. Amelia Caddy. Amelia is an intuitive tarot reader who receives guidance through clairaudience, clairvoyance, clairsentience, and claircognizance. Several years ago, she transitioned from academia into reading tarot full time and became and began reading and channeling messages for the collective on YouTube, as well as working on a one-to-one basis with clients. Her focus is always on self-empowerment. Although tarot is the medium through which Amelia most frequently reads, she believes that like many other forms of divination and insight, tarot is a tool for the intuitive abilities we all have. You can find Amelia at Amelia's Tarot PhD on YouTube, as well as at AC underscore tarot on Twitter and through her website, theameliacaddy.com. Welcome, Amelia. It is so fantastic to have you here today. How are you doing? Hi, Steph. Thank you so much for inviting me on. It's lovely to be here. I'm good. Hello, everyone listening as well. I'm really excited to have you on Divine Feminines. I remember I told you about my vision to bring out this podcast Mm -hmm. back in 2020 when I actually joined your interview on your channel. So actually for the listeners, there is an interview that I've done with Amelia back in, I think, January 2020. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's really lovely. Actually, it's come full circle. And we did speak back then. Um, I know you mentioned having me as a guest. So, you know, congratulations. I'm so happy for you that everything's up and running and um, and I can be here. It's really cool. I'm, I'm super excited. I, you can't, I can't tell you enough. Um, <laughs> and to be able to talk about Twin Flames, it's, mm. I can't believe I'm doing this publicly. I'm like, oh, the thrill yes. of it. it is quite, it's something that I used to kind of keep quite close to my chest. But yeah. the, the podcast and what our messages are really to just share our experiences and help others so that they don't mm-hmm. feel alone. And yeah. I feel that your channel was a, a great way of me realizing that I'm not alone. Um, So it was amazing to come across your channel. And um, first, I think what I'll do is I'll explain to our listeners what I feel a twin flame is. So a twin flame is a high vibrational soul connection and sometimes called a mirror soul. It's thought that it's it's the other half of your soul. And it's based on this idea that sometimes a soul can be split into two bodies. One of the main characteristics of a twin flame relationship is that it will be both challenging and healing. And this is due to the mirroring nature of a twin flame. They show your deepest insecurities, fears and shadows, but they also help you to overcome them and vice versa. Your twin will also be equally affected by you. I also feel that it allows each twin to really realize their path to self-union and finding the balance between their masculine and their feminine energy within. For myself, I realized that I was on the twin flame journey a few years ago and It was quite um, a revelation for me. I thought I was going kind of crazy and I was reading up on a lot of things and it it felt very lonely as well because I thought this cannot just be a coincidence. I feel like I'm awakening to something um, new. I'm I'm going through a spiritual awakening, of course, but it's, it's also involving this other soul, this other person. And I realized that there was more to it. And then I came across some videos on YouTube and I found you, Amelia, Mm. and I can't tell you how helpful your channel has been, even to this day. I mean, that's that's really lovely to hear because that was, you know, my primary sort of motivation in going on to YouTube, I just, I felt that um, I had something maybe to offer, to share or to help, you know, because as you said, when you, when you first start out on this journey, it's, it's a crazy thing and (laughs) you can feel quite isolated and wonder if you are going crazy. So I'm pleased, you know, that, that I could help in some way. You do. And you still do. And I actually, as you know, I've also, you know, showed a few others, your channel and even um, guided them towards you for readings and, 
from a personal level, some of your readings, and I never believed in tarot before, but the, mm. the, the, the frame of them are all around becoming better in self-empowerment. And it really has helped me become who I am today to be able to share this on the podcast. And I think the, the light work, the mission work you do is incredible. I also feel that those that are on the twin flame journey are becoming more awake to it and um, the collective is growing. So mm -hmm. your information, your wisdom, your guidance is really well sought for right now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so keep doing it. Um, I'm going to tune into your reading later on after we record this because oh, I'm yes, still tuning yes. in. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into some questions. I'm really excited to ask you these. So the first one, I would like you to explain that what the twin flame journey is and its purpose from your point of view yeah okay well just to sort of you know preface all of my answers and say that I, I definitely don't consider myself to be um sort of like a, a twin flame expert you know I'm just sort of um I suppose offering the you know the best that I can here so um you know obviously there are there are many opinions and I'm that's great. You know, it's, it's good to sort of have discussion around this. But I mean, there are definitely two schools of thought. So people say or can say that, that your twin flame is the other half of you, the other half of your soul. And throughout lifetimes, you are, you know, you're brought back together to eventually come into union. And this journey across lifetimes, it's it's challenging specifically for the purpose of health, helping both you and your twin to raise your vibrations to kind of be um, a light in the world and the other school of, th of thought uh, says that your twin is not half of you so you're not a split soul but your twin is like your mirror soul so there is nobody in the world that will trigger you and understand you as much as as your twin um I think in terms of the twin flame journey it's there is some there are definitely some overarching similarities in terms of people's experiences as you mentioned Steph you know the the growing the healing um becoming a sort of a, a more enhanced better version of yourself um but it, it's quite an individual thing and I think you know around the idea of self-empowerment I, I feel it's quite important for people not to compare themselves to other twins to say well you're at this stage you know where am I is there something wrong with my connection um should I be doing this should I be doing that should I be worried so I think um it's important to remember that you and your twin you know when you sort of signed up for this before every incarnation you will there will be certain events that take place that you've pre-agreed and and certain ways that you want things to happen to facilitate learning lessons or healing wounds so that's all very individual um, and I, I really sort of would love for people to to cherish their individual experiences within the twin flame connection and to not kind of let those differences feel worrisome you know yeah I really like that point Amelia it is so true I think that having been on the journey and on the journey that everyone's experience is different. I haven't met many um, twin flames, but I realized that in recent times I've attracted some of them towards me and I feel that they are on the journey. Mm -hmm. And if they've shared with me in privacy, because I don't, you know, I keep it confidential and I like to keep mine confidential for many reasons. Yes. As I'm sure you understand it's mm -hmm. a very personal thing, but when they do share with me, it's sometimes I share certain things with them because my journey has gone on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes do that as a way to just assure them it's okay. You know, yeah. don't worry. Like your, yours is playing out in the way you meant to, but mm -hmm. just remember that you can do it. You were, we weren't called. You didn't make this kind of agreement to come to earth and do this if, if you weren't capable of it. So yeah you know, and it's so true. It's all very different. Some twins are in union already, and there's no need to be jealous of that. And maybe that, you know, they've done all the works in all the lifetimes. This is the lifetime to have the union in the 3D. Yeah. Um, and for some, it might not be this lifetime and it's the next lifetime. And I think th that kind of goes on to my next question, because sometimes people get a bit so romanticized around the the union from a romantic sense mm -hmm. um, and but, but it's not really the purpose the focus is about finding union of self what are your thoughts 
Yeah, I mean, the first thing to say just off of the point you made is that I have spoken with um, a few people who are in union with their twin and they're always surprised that actually it's not this kind of you know, perfect ending to what has felt like a Romeo and Juliet situation of people having these near misses. It, there's actually, um, it, you know, that there may be the struggles or the problems that they experienced before are still there. So it's kind of like Abraham Hicks says, you know, enjoy the journey, <laughs> not yeah. just the destination, because I feel that the the work, and I'm, I'm sort of doing air quotes here, the work doesn't necessarily end once you come into union. But yes, so I mean, you know, when you when you meet your twin, I can, of course, if, why wouldn't you want to be with this person? I completely understand, you know, the the romantic goal at the end of it. And as you said, some people there, you know, they have agreed that they will come into union in this lifetime um, in a 3D sense and they will, you know, be together and fulfill some sort of life purpose in that way. But ultimately, I think whether twins come into union or not, the primary goal and one of the most wonderful things about the twin flame journey and connection is is the growth that twins trigger in each other. You know, you you end up heading in directions, whether it's to do with your outlook, your work, your career. I mean, even where you live that you never even would have considered before meeting your twin. So I think really, yeah, the ultimate goal with the twin flame journey and the goal that's going to help people feel that they are grounded and not going crazy is to focus on self-growth and the journey within the self and coming into union, you know, with, with the self because your twin, although they're your twin, they are still, you know, doing their own thing here in the 3d and, and obviously they have free will. So when they're kind of frustratingly not doing what you want, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, if you get too focused on that, too hung up on that, that can, that can sort of be where the, the problems start to arise, the frustrations, the confusion, you know, all of that. Yeah, that's a really good point, Amelia. Um, the frustration and the emotion mm -hmm. around what happens in the 3D, I, you, you've seen my journey. I know you, you're quite familiar with what's mm -hmm. happened with me and what's been going on with me. And it's, it's phenomenal when I think, you know, the way that I put the focus on the external, whether it was my twin or everything that was happening, it was almost like I was thinking it's happening to me, not that mm -hmm. I create my reality, right? So the mindset and the perception, once I changed that and focused it in on myself, it was extraordinary. Like I was just doing things I never thought I would do. The growth, the yeah. way I changed who I was because I worked on the internal Mm -hmm. Steph and and actually it really created a difference to my external reality the way people in general um, behave towards me communicated towards me what I attracted the opportunities the healing in itself allows you to really come to terms with things that you you don't you, you kind of put aside or you don't realize exist and I think mm -hmm. with your twin there, you know, there's, the, they say the run of the chase of the separation, but the separation, I really do believe it is there not to, not to hurt us, but to help us. And that, you know, the universe wants the best for us. And in the time of separation, for those that are experiencing it, it's, it's a, ch a chance to really go and do the deeper healing to find who you really are, to really get grounded and find your own self union and balance and, and really become whole, which I think, in any situation, whether twin flame or not, you know, if you're getting into a relationship romantically with someone, you want that you want to be whole, you want to feel like you are you, regardless of whether they're with you or not. Yeah, yeah. And also, I think, you know, if, if union comes too quickly, probably both um, twins would be likely to sacrifice too much of themselves or to bend over backwards for one another because there's a fear you know if I repeat something that I did in the past or if I say something it might cause the other person to run and I, I just I just feel that you know our higher selves doesn't want that for us you know we want to our 3d selves our higher selves wants for us to be able to be in a union with someone to feel that we can bring our full self and you know, the other person isn't going to run. So um, I think a lot of that confidence comes through the, the periods of separation as well. And sometimes, you know, the separation will happen over and over and over until you get to a point where you think, well, 
you know, what, what's going to be the difference if I'm completely who I am will end up in separation? Well, we've been there before anyway, you know, so you sort of get pushed to a point where I don't want to say you've got nothing left to lose because that sounds really morbid. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you start to think, OK, well, I've tried this way. I've tried that way. Let me just let me just go for it. Let me do this healing. Let me be who I am. And surely the only outcome that I could see would be something better. You know, we won't be in separation. There won't be this runner chaser dynamic. Yeah. So so healing is healing is important. The separation is important. And I know it sounds boring. It doesn't sound fun. It doesn't sound quick, but it's so worth doing. And I, I kind of feel we can't skip that part, to be honest, either. So, yeah. And, you, you know, you can't force it. You can't sit down and say, right, I'm ready. I'm going to do it. It kind of happens when it happens for you. Um, but I don't think we can circumvent the separations and the healing. Um, yeah, because that's that's such an important part of the journey. Absolutely agree with you. I mean, my dynamic, and I said this on the interview I had with you, is that the runner chaser happened to both sides. So, you know, yes. you know, mm-hmm. I, re- I was running at the beginning and then, then they started running and there's been several kind of, you're talking and then you're in separation several times in my situation. And what mm-hmm. I realized was it was the way I was, you know, like I started to change myself. I started to set boundaries and go, no, no, not this. Oh but mm-hmm. this, and I don't want this. So I kind of have to change up my sort of way of doing things and, mm-hmm. and my outlook on life. And so I think this time around, this seems like, you know, um, the real work is coming through when you start to realize I'm not going to keep doing that. I'm actually going to really make a change for the longer term. And you realize that your whole life changes with that. It's not just, I can't explain it, but so many people feel the energy they they feel the the person that that you've become and they admire it in so many ways without you even having to tell them but yeah. mm-hmm. they can just feel it it's it's kind of crazy I, <laughs> if that makes sense yeah definitely and i mean you know the fact that you're sort of you're here and and you're doing this podcast do you feel that that maybe was in some way to do with your your twin flame journey or the the growth and the direction it sort of pushed you in or is it kind of a separate thing for you it's a really good question and it's so funny because about uh four years ago I spoke about doing a podcast with some friends Mm. and um, it was more going to be like a funny kind of you know um yeah have pizza and some Mm -hmm. some, you know chill out and kind of talk about things that are happening in the Mm. world and our, our opinions and then and then I went on you know quite a deep awakening And then I said, wait, I still want to do the podcast, but it has to have meaning. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I sort of put it to one side, put it to one side. I was going through my own personal changes. And so it's not the right time to speak publicly and help others. But then I realized I need to share these messages. And also Joanna felt the same when I asked her, which was brilliant. And you know of Joanna. And we both felt like there's so much we've experienced and we're still experiencing that we feel it can help others. And I do feel that that's part of my journey that I was meant to be some kind of guide help Mm -hmm. to others. Again, I'm not an expert. I'm just going by my own personal wisdom. And hopefully some of that resonates for someone. And if that can kind of help someone consider doing something differently, and there's a positive outcome of it, then I'm really happy that I could be an influence to them. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And yeah, like you said, I mean, the journey, it doesn't, it sort of, it doesn't end. Um, So we're always acquiring new information and seeing things differently. So um, yeah, I just, I feel like it's, as I said at the start, it's really important to, to think of it more as a community rather than having, you know, the leaders and then the people who kind of follow. And I know, of course, that there will be certain people who maybe have more knowledge and we look to them as as being leaders in the Twin Flame community. But I don't know, it's just, it's kind of an ethereal concept for us in the 3D, no matter how much we learn. So um, yeah, Yeah. I I kind of like the continually evolving um, perspective and the idea of, of a growing community. And actually, I know it's not in one of my questions, but it's just come to mind as you said mm-hmm. this, is um, as I was starting to look for, you know, guidance and, and, and sort of information, there was yeah. other twin flame type coaches or readers or YouTube channels. And as soon as I read, like watched their, their video or read some of their content, it my body reacted weird. I was like, mm-hmm. no, I don't yeah. think... And it's not that they're they're wrong and not mm-hmm. that they're bad people, but I was like, I 
don't agree with your message. It mm-hmm. doesn't, it doesn't align for me. And yeah. then I found you and I thought, wow, it aligns. And I think literally you and maybe one or two other channels align for me, but you were the one. And I think that's my message to everyone that if they are looking for support and guidance and some information, definitely go out and look for it and then trust yourself, yeah. trust your intuition. What feels right and makes sense and feels like it's helping you is probably your message and some guidance. Yeah what doesn't and maybe triggers you and makes you feel very uncomfortable stay away from (laughs) definitely definitely. and also it's so interesting because especially with tarot as well me personally I love to watch tarot um and I've noticed that readers who maybe I really resonated with strongly you know a year ago or so not so much now and the ones that I just love watching you know for their delivery and the way they interpret the cards but maybe they weren't really telling my story they're maybe starting to tell my story more so I think it's also important not to box yourself yourself in and say well I follow these people or I speak to these people about it and to to allow you know the right teachers to come in and the right sort of fears to come in um, at the right time for you and to be okay with sort of releasing people when they need to be released yeah that's a really good point (laughs) releasing people and even in your own personal life letting go and just surrendering to the process yeah Um, what's meant to be will come your way and kind of go with the flow I think is one of the best ways to frame how to deal with the twin flame journey because we're always trying to control things in our life mm-hmm. when you want to control kind of how things are going to go and it almost creates more resistance for you doesn't mm-hmm. it so my next question is for those that don't resonate with the twin flame journey um divine feminine and divine masculine still applies right and we have both energies within us mm-hmm. it does exist regardless of whether you're in a twin flame journey or not yeah yeah I think so I mean we have different labels that we put on this you know I think most people are familiar with the idea of the yin and yang energy we have masculine and feminine we can talk about the light side and the shadow side you know if we want to to take it further into more sort of psychology we have like the ego and the the subconscious and all of that yeah I mean we definitely have masculine and feminine energy I think um, there's a, a massive discussion that could be had around this but for me and not just me, but, but I, I do think that the masculine energy within us is more out, outward driven. You know, the the, um, the face that we put on when we go out into the world, taking action on things, um, whereas our feminine energy is is sort of more receptive. Um, and it might be about sort of self-reflection at times. And, and the balance is important because it's about knowing when to push forward and when to stop. I have a stupid example that I love to use. I don't know why, but it's about making toast. And if I'm <laughs> hungry and I think, OK, I'll make some toast. That's my masculine energy. I go out into the kitchen. You know, I put the, the bread in the toaster. I'm doing all this. But if I'm going to then reap the benefit of that outward driven energy, I've got to, to stop you know, and to receive, I've got to eat the toast, I've got to take a moment to allow myself to receive. So I think we we, we need a balance really, across, you know, not just the twin flame journey, but but everything we're doing in life for things to kind of to to work in the way we want them to work and to work as smoothly as they can. Because, you know, if someone's maybe a workaholic, and they're pushing and pushing and pushing, and they're not quite getting the the feedback or or seeing the impacts they wanted to or they're exhausted you know it might be because actually although it seems counterproductive it's time to step back into more of of like a feminine kind of energy and to receive and I'm not you know feminine masculine I'm not sort of saying men are masculine women are feminine or or applying our 3d understandings of what it means to be masculine and feminine Uh, yeah I just I I think it's more in terms of the the receptivity versus the the activity for me Does yeah that make sense? yeah of course and I really resonate with that it's actually like from a personal perspective you can also and I've read up about it and I've also mm-hmm. felt it in myself when you look at your body the right side of your body is meant to represent the masculine yeah. energy and the left side the feminine and mm-hmm. I went for a massage one time and I started getting you know, I was flying a lot and I was getting lots of kind of like, you know, stiffness and pain mm-hmm. a little bit in my hips. And and I thought, oh, it's because I've been sitting on loads, loads of planes. This was obviously before COVID. Then when I, you know, my uh, massage therapist said to me, well, this is interesting. 
if you if you read this into energy, your mm-hmm. right side, your masculine side seems a little bit overworked. You've been putting in too much action. Maybe you've been doing a bit too much, but your left side, your feminine side is a bit stiff. That's why you're not feeling pain <laughs> there because it's yeah. stiff. So you need to receive more. And I personally could resonate with that because part of my twin flame journey was the lack of reciprocity. I think mm-hmm. I was overgiving, and I'm sure there's some divine feminines that might, re- you know, resonate with what I'm saying now. But I was, I didn't realize, you know, when you're in that twin flame connection, you're so, you're almost like head over heels. You don't realize that you become so vulnerable and you really are kind of showing your full self and you want to do everything, but you, you might overgive, you might do things and it might be attached to areas that need to be healed. And I found out that actually I had the overgiving because it was to compensate for emotional unavailability that I kind of um, inherited from my dad from young. So I had that kind of play out with my dad, but then it played out with me because I kind of took on that energy, which is really interesting. And I worked on that and I started to heal it. But every time I get a bit of a right side pain, I'm like, what's going on? Is it to do with my dad? Is it to do with me overdoing it? Or is it just because I've been running too much and that? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I I definitely agree with you, Amelia. I I do think it's, um, it's the energy with within and it's the action versus the receiving. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that you understand that you you get to flow more with the universe. And it's a real, it's really a beautiful experience because you start to realize that you have to be open to want to receive and receive help. And I think some of us women, um, and I I, want to say women because we kind of have this, it's been hard, you know, with the feminist movement where we're trying to be empowered and then we forget that actually it's okay to ask for help. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So I I believe not everyone meets their twin flame in this lifetime, but do meet multiple soulmates, like soulmates being friends, family, romantic partners. What's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I I agree with you, definitely. And actually, um, I've come to love, absolutely love soulmates. <laughs> it's almost like I sit back and for me personally, I watch them come in and out of my life. You know, some are here to stay, some are here for a time. And if I can step back and objectively look at each of them and what they've helped me with or shown me or, or the lessons they've taught me or the experiences we've had, I think it's great. And Often soulmate connections aren't as tumultuous as twin flame connections. So that's that's definitely a bonus. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, soulmates, yeah, they can be romantic. They could be your next door neighbor, a, an incredible teacher you had at school one time, um, you know, your doctor, your dentist, literally anyone. And um, they can they can be here for a lifetime. You could have one great summer with a soulmate. Um, you could meet a soulmate and actually you could have a really just difficult experience. And at the end of it, you think, why did I meet this person? But it's probably because they were helping to illuminate something or to bring some kind of wisdom. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think we have many, many soulmates. And as you said, some romantic and some not. Yeah, I I definitely agree with you. And I when I look back, I I've had some fantastic friends that are not no longer in my life now. But I yeah. do feel that they were soulmates because we connected so well at that point mm-hmm. in my life, and mm-hmm. it, it it had a purpose. But then as we grew, we had to grow apart or go our separate ways because, like you said, something needed to be illuminated or there was a lesson to be learned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, it's about I've been learning this, but it's really about understanding that and thanking the person for coming Mm -hmm. into your life and to what they gave you and what you were able to learn uh, the experiences and the insight and the wisdom rather than it having to be oh they've gone you know like forget them and have this resentment I think we need to accept that you know people come they go and we need to kind of have this honorable an honorability about that you know honor that connection for what it was and 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 kind of maybe say farewell to it, but be still be thankful for that for it as well. Yeah, mm. yeah, I agree. And um, you know, sometimes soulmates they they're kind of like the um, like the trigger in terms of of pushing you in in a new direction in your life that that ends up snowballing into something amazing. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's hard not to have gratitude for that. Um, you know, of course, if it's if it's a connection that ended in a difficult way, I guess it's harder. But if we're talking, let's say, about like friends or even family members, um, 
I think it's nice. I think it's kind of nice to think, well, you know, for a year I was really close to that person and then we kind of just drifted apart and there are no hard feelings, but, you know, they opened my eyes to, to so many things. And um, yeah, I think soulmates are great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. So on another note, how do you know if you're with a karmic partner or having a karmic partner experience? What's your thoughts on this? Mm. Um, okay, so I think, you know, that's that's quite a, a personal individual thing. So it's kind of difficult to say because every connection has karma that plays plays out. But what I would say about a connection with a karmic partner is that it might feel more difficult than anything else. And um, it might feel like there's, there's quite a lot of struggle. Um, and once the karma has balanced, whatever this karma is, you might feel that there's there's not really much keeping you together. And depending on how long it's taken, it could be that there's a familiarity or, you know, there's a comfort in the knowledge of each other or, or the routine of whatever you've got going. But karmic partners, I feel they their, their main purpose and pretty much the only purpose is, well, you know, that you're balancing out karma, whether it's from a, pr a previous lifetime or um, even if it's someone in this lifetime that you were with and you separated and then you got back together. Um, so balancing of karma or helping to learn a lesson. But usually the lesson is not the most fun of an experience. You know, it's it's not like you're in class and you're having a great time. It, it's difficult. And you might feel like you're always butting heads. I mean, you were talking earlier about respecting the reaction of your body in terms of letting you know if something is right or wrong and I feel like when it comes to karmic partners your body will tell you this is not the one you'll always have that nagging feeling yeah you know? no I, I absolutely agree and I, I know what you mean it is personal I probably am happy to share this but I feel I've had a karmic partner and okay. and I don't think it felt like they were a karmic partner to begin with Mm. But I really am grateful for them coming into my life because I learned a lot. Like there was a lesson to be learned. It was a big one um, yeah. and it didn't really seem like it was one lesson. I think it was a series of things and it almost kind of was the trigger to then me spiritually awakening. And when I started mm -hmm. to awaken, I was like, oh, they need to go. I need to go. We can't be together. And um, there, it was tough because you feel like you're kind of, a bit ball and chained to them. It, there is quite heavy energy around breaking from that because yeah. usually, well, I say usually, but from my experience, my karmic partner could not see anything I was seeing, was completely on a different page and was kind of pulling me to this kind of, but you can't go because society says like everything mm -hmm. that was unawakened, they were calling out. And I was like, Oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't see life like that anymore. So mm -hmm. it was interesting. Um, they played a significant role in my life for the time that I think I needed them to be there. I do think that they were meant to be there for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm very grateful for that because I think it showed me where I was coming from, why I had to go through some of those struggles and then get to the other side and go, wow, like I've done that. And I managed to release the karmic partner and let mm -hmm. them go on their way and hopefully they find their happiness and I know I found mine in myself so yeah, yeah. it's yeah, definitely very personal and also I just I, I didn't get to touch on but there's also this concept of like false twin flames and I wonder mm -hmm. if sometimes does that kind of also get confused with the karmic partner and things like that. Yeah, I think so. For me, a false twin flame um, is interesting because I would I would assume that anybody you you kind of feel is your twin flame only to then realize that they might not be. I mean, that's probably like a false twin experience. I'm not too sure really what I think about the idea that that we have these false twins that we're supposed to meet for a reason. I mean, to be honest, I probably would need to, to look more into that before I could, you know, decide sort of how I felt about that. But yeah, I, I suppose I'm more on, on the sort of, or on the side of thinking that it might be maybe a karmic or perhaps it's a soulmate rather than a twin flame. Um, I just feel that that maybe you know, the universe setting you up, for example, with a false twin is, is a bit cruel. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about you? Do you do you kind of think that false twins are that, you know, there are there are specific people who you meet and, and they're your false twin? Or is it kind of a label we put on someone when we're looking back and we realize that that wasn't actually our twin? 
Yeah, I, I think it's the latter. I, I don't mm. believe that there is a false twin flame. I don't even think that that exists. I think mm. it's either a karmic lesson partner or a soulmate. And uh, we we might have thought that was the twin flame, but, but it wasn't. Yeah. And maybe then you do go on to meet your twin flame. Mm-hmm. I've also, you know, I found some very interesting things with others where somebody said to me, oh, I, you know, I never brought up the topic twin flame to them. It was funny. They brought it up to me and said, oh, I haven't seen you for so long. I think I've met my twin flame. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Cause, cause you don't get that in a normal conversation. And no. it kind of made me feel a bit emotional. Cause I'm like, what's going on? Like, I don't really get people coming up to me and saying that someone I knew, but hadn't seen for a while. Yeah. And then afterwards she said to me, yeah, she said, I really think it's my twin flame, you know, because of this and that. And I thought, oh, wow, she's been really kind of looking into it. Mm-hmm. And then later on, she said to me, no, um, this other person is my twin flame. So I was like, huh? But I thought you thought that. So I kind of thought to myself, and this is not with the false thing, but but it's also connected. It's like, sometimes I think people find out about twin flames and then they go, okay, now I need to find the label for that. Is it that, oh, it's that person? Because all of this happened and it resonates to what I've read in this article okay, you're the twin flame. And then Mm. something else pops. I was like, oh no, actually. And I think that that's the wrong way to go about it. I think I genuinely feel, and this is just my opinion, that those that are on the twin flame journey, it happens to them and then they can't believe what's going on. And then it's almost like the universe puts some information in front of them, Mm. like in a synchronistic way and shows them, maybe you should like look into this a bit more. And yeah. then they, and that's when they find out. And genuinely, I think that's normally on the money that that is their twin flame in that in that scenario. If that yeah. makes sense. So, um, Amelia, how often do you find that the divine feminine is the more awakened twin? It's kind of hard for me to say because I think every person that who I've worked with on a one to one basis or who watches my videos identifies themselves as a divine feminine. And um, I'm yet to pin down an elusive divine masculine and ask them, you know, (laughs) for their side, I would love to. Um, So, yeah, I mean, maybe that's a a, a sign in itself that that it's the divine feminines that who appear. Um, Whereas, you know, where are the divine masculines? Um, So, yeah, I suppose it seems that the divine feminines are more awakened or maybe they awaken first. But I do think there's some truth in the fact that as you as we were saying about the runner chaser, how it flip flops back and forth. Mm. There might be times or or particular areas within the, the connection that say the divine masculine is further ahead and has something to show the divine feminine. Um, or an area in which the divine masculine feels more comfortable. And so that sort of pushes them a little bit further ahead. So I would say overall, it tends to be, in my experience, the divine feminine who is more awakened. But um, I think it would be a mistake to think it's it's always a divine feminine, you know, um, who's going to be up ahead. And I say it's a mistake because sometimes, you know, the divine feminines will say, I'm confused. I all this time I thought I was the divine feminine, but actually I think I'm the divine masculine. <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, and, and it sends people into a tailspin. But actually, it's fine because sometimes the energy does flip around like that. And whereas maybe you you were sort of steaming ahead and and forging the path and and forging the way forward, maybe something has come up physically in the three D or energetically, so you can just sense it and your divine masculine is is kind of taking the lead. So yeah, I think divine feminines tend to be a little bit more awakened initially anyway, but there are times I think when the roles can reverse and I think that's fine. That's okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I feel that resonates for me a lot. I, you know, I've read before that they they kind of call it one twin is the spiritual twin and one is the matrix twin living mm. the 3D reality. That resonated for me a lot because I do feel like I'm the spiritual one. Yeah. Not saying that my twin isn't, but I feel like I'm the one that had to maybe get into it a bit more in depth. And then I realized my life path number was seven, which is very spiritual. So mm. it all resonated for me really well. But also the other thing that I noticed is some of your readings and some things I've I've seen from other sort of um, twin flame readings is that the divine feminine almost holds this light. So she's going forward. She's evolving. She's liberating herself. She's healing. She's really, you know, 
knocking down all the walls and the barriers of society's, you know, conformities and all of these kind of expectations that we've had to have through uh, all generations. And she's doing this and it's because she's doing this and she's kind of charging forward. That light is being shone and the divine masculine sees it and it's giving him encouragement to keep going. I do feel that there's something like that that is happening and it's happening right now. I feel like not just for the twin flames, but all divine feminines that are going in that direction Mm -hmm. just for the collective, that there are divine masculines as a group that also see those lights and they're kind of going, Oh, you know, that's where, you know, that's the right direction. This is where I need to liberate myself from. Mm, Yeah, I agree. It's interesting because I kind of feel that everything has balance. You know, we were talking about the, the union of masculine and feminine within, for example, and, um, I just feel, and again, this will be on an individual basis, but with the divine feminines being definitely maybe, you know, the spiritual leaders holding that torch, whether they're intending to or not, you know, the divine masculine sees and and thinks that's interesting. Okay, so there's another way of doing things and starts to feel inspired. I do wonder, so what is it then that the divine masculine is maybe showing or helping the divine feminine to realize, you know, is there something, as you yes. were talking about the matrix, is there something more 3D focused that the divine masculine is highlighting perhaps to the divine feminine? You know, I want to share something with you, Amelia, that I came to realize. I, I, I found out about it a while ago, but because of the interaction that you have with your twin, there's mm. almost like fragments. This is what I've come to understand. And it's kind I do believe it. That there's almost fragments of my soul in them and their soul in, in mine. Mm. And it's about understanding, okay, what of those fragments of my twin in my soul, what is it that has positively impacted me and made me who I am and who I'm growing to be? So I, I have been kind of reflecting on that. And I've really realized that actually my, my, twin the divine masculine in my case for me actually was saying to me a while ago a few years ago like where is Stephanie Dessar where is she and I I, yeah at the time I was like okay I get what you're saying but I want to see her I I really want to see her shine stand Mm. out and when I look back I'm like oh my gosh he he said it to me yeah (laughs) he said it to me and now I'm here (laughs) hello (laughs) so um it's incredible because when he said it to me, it was well before I did some of the major transformations. Yeah. And now, you know, the other day I was meditating and I almost had, I did, I had tears in my eyes because I was like, she's here. I'm here. Hello. I'm, I'm here. This is me liberated. So I do believe that they do shine a light into our souls and we shine a light into their souls. I do think like you said, there is a balance. Maybe mm. the feminine might be a little bit more bold and overt in the 3D, whereas yeah. the masculine might still be kind of holding the mask up because society sort of judges so much. It's so hard to overcome the way the world goes and, and mm-hmm. what media says and everything. There's so much pressure. So I think it takes them a bit longer to sort mm-hmm. of go, hey, I'm here, but they are doing it. But I think they're a bit low key, maybe. Yes. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And, you know, as with Twin Flames, there are often those um, those big obstacles, you know, huge age gaps or living in different countries. And, you know, maybe someone's already in a marriage or, or um, different religions and backgrounds and that sort of thing. So you're definitely right that there are some real obstacles sometimes to overcome. Yeah. And it does tend to be the divine feminine who who seems to be more ready to jump forward. But I do feel that the masculine's they contemplate more, I think, and um, <laughs> very quietly, but they are they are moving forward. <laughs> when you said contemplate, I was thinking overthinking sometimes is sometimes. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's an overthinking because of the way society has been to the masculine. I think it's been really hard on the masculines um, over hundreds of years and how things have changed. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it's a big it's a big change for them to then sort of say this is who I am and this is what I believe I'm going against everything that I was taught so in most twin flame journeys why do you think that the divine masculine's actions are so common and predictable I think you know sometimes in your readings it seems like a lot of the masculines in the collective are doing a lot of the same things or going through the same things do you think that this is because of what I've just said about how there's a big awakening and going against what they've been taught do you think that's why they act so common and predictable (laughs) 
<laughs> Sorry if that sounds bad. <laughs> You're so predictable. <laughs> it's funny. Um, gosh, I mean, I think, yeah, yeah, because they're, they're up against, well, programming, as you said. And if we're talking about asking anyone, divine masculine or otherwise, to make um a decision that will be life altering in one way or another. Um, I think the the reactions to that are going to be similar. It's going to be outrage or anger, um, hesitation. It might be running from the situation, trying to ignore the situation um, and eventually sitting down and realizing it's not going anywhere. I've got to think through this. So I think that's probably common just to humans, you know, facing something big for the first time as in this situation not that they've never faced anything big <laughs> but um, you know facing this this twin flame journey you know encountering it for the first time and realizing that they've got to make some decisions and often I think it can feel like the divine feminine is, is placing everything on them and saying well you've got to you're the one who's got to leave somebody you're the one who's got to do this and to do that um, whereas I think really often what the divine feminine wants is the communication or honesty or to know yeah tell me, where do you stand? What do you need? What are you thinking? Um, but the divine masculine can internalize this as you're making demands of me, or you expect me to do this and that when that's not really the case. And, and anyone, you know, would shut down, I think, or drag their feet or overthink if, if that's kind of how they felt, if they felt like the weight of the world was on their shoulders. So I think that's why collectively, we see so many of the same reactions from them. And and also, I think, would you agree that because the the dynamic with the divine masculine and divine feminine that that there's an intense you know connection that they mm. you don't feel with anyone else so it almost kind of puts you in a really uncomfortable position it's like well I've not been here before oh this is out of my comfort zone no I need to control I yes. need to, you know and you yeah. and and they do that right they they kind of retreat they don't want to talk they'll talk mm-hmm. when they feel like it and they'll talk on their terms and they give the ambiguous remarks because they kind of still want to keep the control because they're not used to experiencing this type of dynamic before mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah I agree with you completely and sometimes there's fear underneath as well and we feel like if we can control what's happening around us we can keep the fear um at a minimum and also as you were saying you know I feel divine masculines and anyone who really resonates strongly with with masculine energy divine masculine energy um is used to being able to control the things around them you know work and um, what they do for a hobby and how often and when so yeah it's definitely uncomfortable to suddenly encounter something and maybe someone who for the first time makes you feel that you don't have control so you know you you default to doing what you would normally do but it just doesn't work in these high vibrational connections yeah, absolutely. I was getting the image of the emperor card upside down, thinking control, oh, yes. <laughs> control yeah, and yeah. manipulation, but not yeah. in it, not in the view of them trying to be horrible. It's just they're trying to self protect, but almost yeah. it becomes self sabotage as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at which I think a lot of feminines will probably agree that they've experienced. But you have to sometimes almost look back and go, "Oh, it was that. It wasn't about me. It's about you know them dealing with themselves." And I think yeah. that's where feminines are not supposed to take it personal I think Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. so you know the numbers 11 11 for me (laughs) um the first time I saw 11 11 my twin texted me at 11 11 and I didn't know that that was my twin flame till then after that point I started seeing 11 11 for every almost every other day or day and years months or whatever you want to call it till present moment um so what are your thoughts around the numbers 11 11 and resonating to the twin flame journey hmm. um yeah so 11 11 it's um it's definitely a twin flame number and you know the 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 numbers sort of mirror one another as as the twins do i mean for me 11 11 I, and any numbers really i feel that it's it's kind of more what you assigned to the numbers you know um it's almost like you're un, unspoken or you're unwritten agreement with your guides or your higher self or spirit you know for me 11 11 means this and then okay so they'll start showing it to you within that context so um, 11 11 initially it can mean you know 
I'm trying to get your attention, pay attention to this. You know, the text message came through at 11.11. So Spirit saying, this is important. This is going to be important um, for you. Mm. Um, or if you're starting something or you're thinking about doing something and you see 11.11, it's often a really good indication that this is kind of a green light. It's time to, to proceed, to move forward. And I found that, that once people start paying attention to 11.11, they'll then move on to other um, synchronicities like, um, 2222 or 333. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I think it's kind of a signal that that something important and special is happening um, and that it's underway right now. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And it's so interesting, Amelia, because when I was seeing 1111 then, what was happening in my life is very different to now. And I still see 1111. <laughs> Um, yeah. But I also see so many other numbers. I think I've become a bit of a guru for numbers. So anytime yeah. someone says to me, I'm sick, because it started to happen that I noticed people were coming to me going, oh, I'm seeing these numbers. And they'll say, I saw this. And I'm oh, that means this. And that means this. And I'm <laughs> like, oh, my goodness, Steph, you've been really seeing these numbers, haven't you? But yeah, I, I do agree. I think you have to kind of place it to the time and the moment that you're in. And um, 1111 for me, I think, is quite a powerful number. I've been able to make significant change and have lots of opportunities to explore. Um, some of the most monumental moments of my life were around seeing that number and making decisions to do things differently. Mm. And I feel like the universe was supporting me in those decisions. So, yeah. Yeah. So pay attention to the numbers, guys. There's messages yeah, in there. Yeah, for you. yeah. And and also what was going on for you at the time, because going online and looking up the meaning is definitely helpful, but also take that and, and make that work for you with your own personal experience as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Amelia, when I first started seeing numbers, I started to document them in a little diary. I oh. had like a, yeah, I did it for two years of signs, wow. but then it got too much because especially with the signs from my twin, the yeah. 5D messages were just ridiculous. I was like, after that, I was like, I'm, I'm going to stop. Um, yeah. It's too much. But I, I, at the beginning, I really wanted to make sure I was understanding the messages from the archangels, from spirit, from universe. So I'd write things down. And then really at the end of the night, um, you know, before going to bed, I'd look at the messages I wrote myself, mm -hmm. what I yeah. saw and sort of tried to decipher, you know, what does this mean? Or, yeah, maybe I was having a really hard time because when you're going through the, uh, you know, some of the awakening stages, it can be very tough, lonely, depressing, um, even if it's like the dark night of the soul type mm -hmm. experience. So those numbers really gave me some like some hope in yeah. some cases, like the 333 three, three, that you've kind of got the angels and you're being yeah. supported and, and things like that. So I was wondering, is it possible, in your opinion, for twin flames to remain as friends or is it a case <laughs> if they come into union, um, if, they, if they can't come into union, sorry, yeah. there's no contact at all? Hmm. I mean, again, that's really down to to the people involved in the connection. I think some twins might find it too difficult because there's always going to be that pull, you know, and how do you deal with that if you're regularly speaking to this person or you're, you know, you're meeting up with them. So some people might decide, okay, no contact is best. Whereas others might feel like, well, even if we're not in contact, I think about you so much that we might as well at least, you know, have this really solid friendship. And um, and I think if you can get to a point where you understand both of you and you agree that, OK, you, you're not going to be together in the 3D, at least right now, um, and you're not going to come into, into physical union, but there is a deep love, understanding, respect and care. I mean, that's kind of wonderful on its own. But, you know, that's... Um, that's a challenge to the ego because we're used to thinking, well, if you love me and I love you, why can't we be together? I don't want you to be with so-and-so. Yeah. So it's definitely, that's, that's a challenge in and of itself, I think. So, yeah, I mean, again, I know of people, not many, maybe two, two people who are in a, in a really good, solid friendship with their twins. But I think, I think that might be too difficult for most people um yeah. just because you know it can be kind of intense and and you've set these boundaries so you might end up feeling that you're silencing yourself and um, and not being authentic which obviously isn't helpful yeah I think um my personal opinion is it might be better to love from a distance and have an understanding yeah. but kind of go your own way because it is so intense but then I was also thinking as you were speaking Amelia that I've also heard around, you know, some twin flames are not romantic. They're here to do mission work. So they're meant to come together to do mm -hmm. mission work on earth. So potentially they're 
There could be a relationship that works well if they're working together and it's not really for romantic reasons. Mm, mm. Yeah, I don't know personally myself if um, about, you know, non-romantic twin flames. I would wonder maybe if that would be a soulmate. But um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's interesting. And I can definitely see that working in that case. And it would certainly eliminate a lot of the the obstacles and problems as well. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so actually speaking of soulmates, you know, we said before they could be friends, family or romantic. Do you think that there's actually more of a higher chance to settle down romantically with a soulmate then? Possibly, yes, just because it's not as, as difficult. I think with a soulmate, things tend to happen more smoothly and more quickly I also feel that they're in they don't tend that with a soulmate there doesn't tend to be so many things that society might look sideways at you know like I was saying the age gap or the different backgrounds or whatever it is you know so there aren't those obstacles that you're up against as well I think being with a soulmate can be you know as as rewarding of an experience a journey and there are soulmates who can you know, sort of elevate the the vibration of twins in terms of doing the healing work and helping each other to identify wounds and and being you know a guiding light for for others. So there's you know it's it's not to say one is better than the other. And I think there's definitely people can definitely be happy with with a soulmate. The only thing I would say is um, if you have if someone has met their twin and deep down that's the person they want to be with, they and they kind of feel like they're settling being with a soulmate. I mean that's not that's not ideal for them or all the the other person, the soulmate. And I know you know, some people have said, well, I have this person in my life and we get on great, but I can't stop thinking about my twin. I don't know what to do. So there can be a bit of a problem there. But um, yeah, otherwise, I guess it might be more likely that people would settle down with a soulmate just because, you know, as we said, there are there are many soulmates and, and it's kind of easier, I think. And often we meet a soulmate first and then we'll meet our twin and we're already with the soulmate. But yeah, that, that's yeah. a whole other thing. Yeah. I was about to say that you could be with a soulmate and then you meet your twin and then you think, oh, my soulmate's my karmic partner. Yeah. Oh, yeah, honestly, Steph, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, it's so much fun. But I really like what you said. And I think I just want to repeat that is that if, if you really do have this longing feeling for somebody and you're with someone else, then question whether you should even be with that person mm-hmm. that you're with full stop. It's not yeah. that you're leaving one person to be with another. Mm-hmm. It's about being happy in yourself. So if you're with someone and you're just doing it because you think, oh, you know, I might not meet someone or, you know, I just yeah. like the company or, you know, mm-hmm. what if I don't like, what if I, yeah, I might not work out with my twin because it's been back and forth or we don't mm-hmm. talk anymore that's fine but don't settle for less like always put yourself first and what is meant to be will happen for you right I I just really believe in that Mm -hmm. life is too short and we don't know what's happening in the next lifetime so I think it's it's best to kind of take be bold and kind of take the risks because I think it pays off for sure so um kind of going off the subject of twin flames a little bit but I still think it's interrelated because as I started to get more into sort of my spiritual journey And I learned about uh, the Akashic records. And then that's when, you know, I was talking to you and I said, you know, you mentioned that you you do do the Akashic records. And I actually got my reading done with you and I found Mm -hmm. it super fascinating. And I just I was hoping you could explain, you know, what are the Akashic records? And do you think that they really help with the awakening journey? The the awakening journey with with Twin Flames or sort of just for the individual? I think both. Uh, But I think, you know, let's say Twin Flames first and then what your thoughts are just overall. Okay, so, yeah, so these these are records. Everybody has them records of of your soul, really, over time um, that you can sort of, you know, you can tap into across any lifetime to to put out information if you have specific questions to see if there's anything you kind of need to know at this time um, or anything that can help you on your way and also to ask about the future you know if I do this how will this look and and what's the best path for you know what I, whatever really <laughs> so yeah so records of, of your soul's history your soul's growth and for me the Akashic records are so I love I love giving Akashic record readings I think they're wonderful because as we you know as we're moving through life we have certain things that just speak to us so let's say for example somebody um 
has this innate love of being around water and they can't explain it. Maybe they grew up in a city miles from water, but they absolutely love it. And it just feels so healing and soothing. And, you know, maybe this person also feels that they have a great community around them here, but they never feel quite at home on earth. Maybe they just feel like, I, I don't understand often why people do the things they do or, or react in certain ways. And, and you know, you, you pull up their records and it turns out, well, that's because they're not from earth. They're a star seed and they're from a planet that was primarily this um, utopian water world. And it just, you know, going into the Akashic records can really help people to to piece things together. And it's like, um, as we were saying, when people first encounter their twin and they're, they're like, what is going on? And then they find out about twin flames and, and it gives them that sort of aha moment. It mm -hmm. can be the same with the Akashic records. And um, I think it's so comforting and encouraging and they can help you to figure out um, you know, what kind of training you have on a soul level and how you can use that in the 3D to have the most fulfilling experience here as well. In terms of twins, hmm, my Akashic record readings, the, one, the ones I've done haven't really been twin flame focused. And I've had questions for people saying, well, if your twin is, is the other half of your soul, does that mean they have exactly the same origin as you you know do they come from the same place and do they have the same experiences and again I have never had the opportunity to read for a divine feminine and a divine masculine um you know who were in union who were each other's twins sorry not in union but but who were each other's divine counterparts yeah. um, and I would love to to see because that would be an amazing way to see or to sort of to test the theory and, and to learn more about the origin of of twin flames whether they're sort of split souls or, or mirror souls and what's going on there so for me I feel the Akashic records um, at least my experience has been that they're a really invaluable it's a really invaluable resource for helping you to slot things into place for yourself and to, to push you forward you know with your own your own journey and your and your soul's growth and your understanding of yourself on a deeper level as well yeah that's really helpful Amelia and I think as you said, to help you propel forward on your own journey. It's interesting because when I asked to do the Akashic Records with you, it was much later down the line after I kind of really was more focused on myself, as yeah. you know. The timing of it was, you know, I've done a lot of the, not saying I'm finished, but I did a lot of the work on self and everything. And then I was like, I want to know more about myself. I want to know kind of where I'm coming from. And I, I was very interested in past lifetimes and mm -hmm. kind of, you know, that that sort of, understanding so I found it really helpful there was things in my um reading that made me think oh my goodness that's why I'm like that there was yeah. one, there was one and I have to laugh about it I think that I found out that I'm not from earth which made sense because I used to always say why am I here <laughs> these people are yes. <laughs> and and I used to feel kind of lonely but then there'd be pe souls I'd meet which I'd yeah. be like but you kind of are on the same page as me so yeah. that would make sense and and then I obviously found out I was a starseed and mm -hmm. you know I think that's when I was like I think that my twin flame must be a starseed because yeah. they tend to flock together and yes. and there was one part that said um I could live off solar energy and not mm. eat. Mm. And I literally can. I'm such a sun body. Like, <laughs> um, although I'm not always in the sun, I could live off the sun. And I noticed how sort of receptive I am to the sun. And mm. when I started to go on to this journey of fasting, I mean, today before I was actually going to do 24 hours, because I, like, I can actually do 24 hours. And I thought, oh, no, 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 I better not because I'm meeting Amelia and I need to have some, just a little bit in my bloodstream of um, some, you know, for my blood sugar level in case I collapse on you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I actually realized, wow, this is making a lot of sense. And yeah. um, there was a lot more in, in my reading, of course. And so I, I think I'd like to just share to the listeners that if you are interested in Akashic Record readings, um, and you want to learn more about your soul, I'd highly recommend it. Whether mm. it's with Amelia or somebody else that you feel resonate, definitely yeah. look into it if, if that's where you are in your journey. 
Yeah, and I think that's a really important point. Anytime someone approaches me about an Akashic record reading, I will always say, you know, I take there's no rush, take the time to look around because everybody will do them slightly differently. And it's kind of the, the sort of thing you only really need to get done once. And they can be an investment in terms of money as well. So you kind of want to make sure you really resonate with the person, that they can pull out the sort of information that you're looking for. So yeah, do it's, it's well worth doing some research and perhaps writing to people and asking them questions as well. Thanks Amelia that's really helpful information and I just wanted to finally ask you um, what do you feel the differences are between star seeds and light workers? Okay it's interesting I feel that um yeah so star seeds really to, to sort of put it in a basic way star seeds are souls who originally are from other planets so so not from earth and I don't think they necessarily have to be light workers in fact there there are certain soul groups from from other planets um, who come to earth and it sounds quite selfish but because their soul wants to experience being in a body um, you know a physical body and and actually having attention so <laughs> oh wow okay <laughs> yeah so a lot of people who who go into acting actually are part of this soul group and um Ooh. you know because they like to be the center of attention they like to have people looking at them and that's an experience that they they wouldn't have had if they didn't come to earth and they're not their primary focus is not really being a light worker um it's it's really just about their soul wanting to to explore that particular thing um light workers they could be star seeds they could be from earth um but these are people who they can sometimes they can feel different you know how we were saying star seeds might sometimes feel that they don't quite fit in. Light workers can feel the same. They often um, will also find that that when, you know, they're watching the news and there's all these sort of horrible things going on, it's too much for them because they're um, used to a higher vibration. And light workers can sort of bring the light and bring healing and inspiration to people in, in so many different ways. It definitely doesn't have to be only within, you know, a, a spiritual sense. So yeah, so I would say star seeds don't always feel that that they have this purpose, which is to guide or to heal or to enlighten. Um, but light workers, I feel they do, whether they're conscious of it or not. And it might be that people look at light workers and find them very healing to be around, very inspirational. And the light worker doesn't even know. They're just being themselves. That's really interesting. I, I wonder if I'm like a hybrid between the two, because I do feel like I'm, I want to share my experiences. Mm -hmm. But then I do feel like I'm just this um, alien on Earth sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> but I think the beautiful thing about what I learned from sort of star seeds and light workers that they are trying to bring higher vibrations to earth and we definitely need it at a time like this where mm -hmm. everyone's kind of getting a lot of wor worried stressed with lots of changes in the world and kind of still kind of getting caught up in fear and and actually it's fear what holds us back from us really living a good happy high vibrational life I think Amelia, it has been absolutely fantastic to have you on this on this podcast, on this episode of Twin Flames. I can't actually believe that we've done this. Um, I really actually hope, and I forgot to say this, that there are um, a divine masculine and a divine feminine that come forward and ask for their Akashic records. I think you've spoken it into existence now. Yes, that so would I, be wonderful. I feel that that's going to manifest, so I'd love to hear about it when it happens. Yeah, um, I want to know. And um, yeah, it's just been it's been super insightful. I think that um, this is a great opportunity for our listeners to learn more. And I just can't thank you enough for being here today. Well, thank you, Steph, so much for asking me. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled that we could sit down and have this chat. And also, I know it sounds a bit weird, but I feel really proud of you, you know, for, oh. because we can speak about this and here you are doing it. So it's excellent. It's awesome. I'm so happy. Oh, thank you, Amelia. I really do appreciate you. And I look up to you all the time. I'm always sort of in my meditation, calling you out saying thank you and just always oh, yeah. honoring you. It's lovely. Yeah, you've been you've been a real light and a real guiding kind of inspiration. So I just keep doing what you're doing. And whatever is called of you and you feel is right, go in that direction, follow your heart, because you you have a massive impact on us and um, and on myself as well. 
Mm. Well, thank you. And now you're out here having an impact on others. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And isn't it lovely that we're all connected in some way? So I think yeah. that that's yeah. the beauty of all of this. So yeah. I'd like to just remind the guys that if you'd like to find out more about Amelia, you can visit her on her YouTube channel. It's Amelia's Tarot PhD as well. She's on Twitter at AC underscore Tarot. And you can also visit her website, the AmeliaCaddy.com. Amelia, you do do um, one-to-one readings. So I think um, when she does do them, they'll be up on the site and you can also uh, book if you're interested. I know she's in high demand and sometimes the readings are not available, but please check out the site. I encourage you if you're looking for some insight and some self-empowerment guidance. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in the next episode.